right, everybody, welcome back to our study of the Gospel of John. Let's get into it. We're going to take chapter 18, the betrayal and the arrest in the garden. So here in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 18, Jesus is going to enter the garden, and he's going to be followed by Judas and his troops. All right, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, they came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So, when Jesus went from the city of Jerusalem and crossed the book Kidron, this small stream was the drainage from the temple, and it would be reddish from all the blood of thousands of the Passover lambs. This would have been a vivid reminder of Jesus of his soon to sacrifice there. Um, and so when Jesus crossed the book Kidron, it would be red with the blood of the lambs. <clears throat> and so that would remind him of this approaching sacrifice. Uh, we kind of missed that in the text there. And so John did not name this as the Garden of Gethsemane, but the other gospel writers did. We find this out in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. Jesus often met there with his disciples, perhaps to sleep for the night under the shelter of the olive trees or in a nearby cave. Luke chapter 21 verse 37 will say that during this Passover week, Jesus spent the nights with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Yet probably not only during that week, but they often met there. This would be a very curious way of referring to Jesus' custom on the present uh, visit only. It probably is going to indicate that he had been in the habit of using the garden throughout the years. And so this is a familiar place. Um, Judas came to this garden with a team of soldiers to seize and arrest Jesus. He led both a detachment of troops, which is a large number of Roman soldiers, and officers from the temple security force. So why they came with such force is not really directly answered. The religious leaders or the Romans must have expected or feared some kind of battle or conflict. Um, and so lanterns and torches, with those they came, they were intending to search corners, caverns, uh, provided that Christ had hidden himself, for they would not have needed them for any other purpose. It was the 14th day of the moon's age in the month of Nisan, and consequently, the moon would appear full and bright. And so this detachment of troops was well armed with swords and clubs. And Jesus noted how unnecessary it was. In Matthew 26, verse 55, he says, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. And so th- this word detachment here, that word, if it's correctly used, it can have three meanings. It is the Greek word for a Roman cohort, and a cohort had about 600 men. If this was a cohort of auxiliary soldiers, a spira had 1,000 men, 240 cavalry, and 760 infantry. So sometimes, much more rarely, the word is often used for a detachment of men called a maniple, which is made up of 200 men. Either way, it's a large number of men for just one guy. And so... That article for detachment is going to point to the battalion which was garrisoned in the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem. The officers are members of the temple police, which is a body of men drawn from the, temp- uh, the tribe of Levi. This is going to show that Judas misunderstood the nature of Jesus, and at the same time, he underestimated his power. Had Jesus been of the nature to physically battle against Judas and the devil driving the betrayer, then that detachment of troops was not enough. A sinless man in an appointed garden was about to do battle with Satan's representative. Luke 22, verse 3. The first time this happened, the sinless man failed. The second Adam, on the other hand, Jesus Christ, would not fail. Okay? It's a representative of the garden, right? Adam failed in his test in the garden. Now Jesus here, right? We'll note that Jesus is a total reversal of of what Adam did at the beginning. All right, so the second Adam, as Jesus has referred to here, was not going to fail. Verses 4 through 6, Jesus is going to speak to Judas in this detachment of troops. Verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and said to them, 
Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And so Judas was hoping to catch Jesus by surprise, but this is impossible. Jesus' entire life was prepared for this very hour, and he was ready for it. Right? God wasn't surprised by this. He's not making it up as he goes. From the before the foundations of the world, this was all mapped out. And the more we get into Scripture, the more you, this is why I encourage people to get in their Old Testaments. The whole time, God's been pre- pre- preparing for this moment. And so, taking the lead here, Jesus said this for at least two reasons. He wanted any potential violence to be directed to him and not to his disciples. So he wanted to identify himself. And Jesus also wanted Judas and the, this detachment of troops to announce their evil intention, right? Who are you seeking? And so he says, I'm, you know, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is a common name that was Jesus was known by. Jesus wasn't normally identified by his role as a rabbi or a carpenter and not by his apparent parentage. Um, Jesus ben Joseph. Jesus chose and received the title that identified him with Nazareth. And he says, I am. Jesus answered them with this very curious phrase. Two words in both English and in the original language, ego emi. It is curious because Jesus didn't say, I am he. He simply said, I am. The he is added by the translators and it is not in the original text. With this, Jesus consciously proclaimed that he is God. Right? Remember the burning bush. Connecting his words to the many previous I am statements recorded in the Gospel of John, particularly in uh, chapter 8, verse 58, but also in chapter 6, 8, 9, 10, um, 11, and 14 as well. Those references on the screen for you to dig out. And so the soldiers had came out secretly to arrest a fleeing peasant, but in gloom they find themselves confronted by a very commanding figure who, so far from running away, comes out to meet them and speaks to them in the very language of deity, of God. That Greek ego emi is rendered I am, he, might well suggest divinity to those that are familiar with the Greek Bible, for it is the rendering in the Septuagint of the sacred name of God from Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. When Jesus declared his divine identity in the words I am, Judas and these soldiers all fell back. There was such a display of divine presence, majesty, and power in those two words that the enemies of Jesus were powerless to stand against him. This is going to show that Jesus is completely in control of the situation. As a practical matter, Jesus did not have to go with this arresting army led by Judas. With God's power expressed through his words alone, Jesus could have overpowered them and easily escaped. And when you flash forward to the end, Jesus merely speaks and deals with the, all the enemies that rise up against him at the end. In both Armageddon and Gog and Magog. He just speaks. It's not even a battle. It's over before it really starts. And so our Lord chose to give them this proof of his infinite power. That they might know that their power cannot prevail against him if he chose to exert his might. Seeing that the very breath of his mouth confounded, they drove back and struck them down to the earth. So Jesus is in total control. He was born as a humble baby, yet he was announced by angels. He was laid in a manger, yet he was signaled by a star. Jesus submitted to baptism as if he was a sinner, and then he heard the divine voice of approval. Jesus slept when he was exhausted, but he awoke to calm the storm. He wept at a grave, and then he called the dead to life. Jesus surrendered to arrest, then declared, I am, and shocked all the troops over. Jesus died on the cross, but in it he defeated sin, death, and Satan. Which is contrary to what the Pope is currently saying, because the Pope, I just saw, uh, blatantly not only prayed with every major religion in the world, but declared that the cross was God's greatest failure. That's shocking, coming from the Pope. To say that the cross is somehow God's greatest failure. When we see here, it's God's greatest victory. Verse 7 through 9. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. 
And so Jesus didn't want these soldiers to panic and injure his disciples. And Jesus called their attention back to him and asked them again a question they're probably hesitant to answer. And Jesus, he says the same words. He says, I am, ego emi. Yet Judas and the troops did not fall to the ground as before. This is going to show that these were not magic words. But previously they fell at the conscious display of God's power. And so after the display of power described in verse 6, Jesus did not continue to oppose his arrest. Jesus willingly gave himself up in order to protect his disciples. This was the same sacrificial love that was going to find its ultimate peak at the cross for the entire world. It also shows why Jesus knocked the soldiers to the ground. The show of power was to protect the disciples, not Jesus himself. So in a sense, he sacrificed himself for their safety. He had promised the Father that he'd protect them in verse 12 in chapter 17, and he fulfilled that guarantee of the voluntary surrender of his life. The disciples took the words, let these go their way, as their signal to leave. They probably left as fast and as quietly as they could have. And so, in doing all of this, Jesus fulfilled what he already said back in chapter 6, verse 39, and chapter 17, verse 12. I have lost none. Of those whom you, the Father, gave me, the Son, I have lost none. Verses 10 through 12. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And so Simon Peter with the sword. The disciples apparently sometimes carried swords. And Luke 22 verse 38 will indicate that they had at least two on this occasion. Having a sword made sense in which there were robbers and violent men to consider, especially during these times. Each of the other gospel accounts are going to mention that one of the disciples did this. But John is going to be the only gospel writer that says it was Simon Peter who made this attack. Peter wanted to fulfill his previous promise that he made to Jesus to defend him at all costs. where he's In Matthew 26, verse 35, he says, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so it is exceedingly thoughtless in Peter to try to prove his faith by the sword, while he could not do so by his own tongue, as we're going to find out later. And so he cut off this guy's right ear. It's been noted but not proved that this meant that Peter, holding the sword in his right hand, he must have attacked the high priest's servant from behind because it would be nearly impossible to cut off his right ear if he was facing this servant, Malchus. It is entirely possible that Peter deliberately chose a non-soldier and attacked him from behind. So this is not a shining display of courage here. It may be significant that John alone mentioned the high priest's servant by name, Malchus. And this is going to be another piece of evidence that John had connections to those in the household of the high priest that we're going to find in verse 16. It may also indicate that Malchus later became a Christian because often the people in the gospel and Acts are named because they were known among the early Christian community. He says, put your sword back in the sheath. Jesus did not praise Peter for what he did. He told him to stop. This was, one, to protect Peter as, as much as it was to protect those who came to arrest Jesus. And most of all, it was that Jesus could drink the cup the Father gave to Jesus, which is the measure of suffering and judgment that he was going to endure. John, the gospel writer, named Peter as the offender, but did not tell that Jesus miraculously healed that cut-off ear of the high priest's servant, like Luke does in Luke 22, verse 51. Uh, The captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. That will describe two different groups. The captain was the Roman commander, and the officers of the Jews were the temple security force. Uh, That commander was the officer in charge, possible the executive of the Roman garrison in Jerusalem, because that same term is used in Acts 22-23 as well. The technical expression is going to strengthen the impression that the Romans supported the action of the Jewish hierarchy. And so they bound him. They regarded Jesus dangerous enough to send many soldiers after him. So in custody, they bound Jesus, treating him as if he was a threat. Yet Jesus remained bound only because he surrendered to his father's will. Hands that healed the sick and raised the dead could certainly break bonds. We could say that in spiritual application, there was two ways that Jesus was bound. Jesus was bound with the cords of love, and he was bound with our own bonds. 
verses 13 and 14. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Siaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Siaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And so Annas was not the official high priest, but as the father-in-law to Siaphas, he was the one who put Siaphas in office. Annas was the power behind the throne in Jerusalem. Right? He himself had been the high priest from 6 to 15 AD. Four of his sons also held the high priesthood, and Siaphas was his son-in-law for reference. And so he says it, it should be expedient that one man should die for the people. This unknowing prophecy of Siaphas was recorded back in chapter 11 of John. So without knowing, Siaphas spoke the truth that it was good for Jesus to die for the people. In that unknowing prophecy that Siaphas spoke logically, the good of the many outweighed the good of that one, but not morally, it was wrong to put an innocent man, God's Messiah, to death. One reason John's going to remind us of what Siaphas said in chapter 11 is to show that the judgment against Jesus was already decided. It was, it was not going to be a fair trial. Jesus might expect a little from such a judge. Here was no idealist ready to see that justice was won, but a cynical politician who had already spoken in favor of Jesus' death. Verse 15 and 16. Peter and John are going to follow Jesus to the house of the high priest. Verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. And so Peter embarrassed himself at the Garden of Gethsemane with a sword in the ear of the high priest's servant. Hoping for a second chance to show his loyalty, he follows Jesus where he was held. Most people will believe that the other disciple was John himself, who had previous connections with the high priest and his household. He was known to the high priest. Um, and so it may be that the family had connections with the priesthood, either by business relationships or possibly by marital ties. John's connection to the high priest and his servants is going to explain how Peter and John had any access to the property of the high priest on such a night like this. Verse 17 and 18, Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of the coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them, and he warmed himself. So a simple servant girl who minded the door to the courtyard of the high priest's house questioned Peter. This right here is the first test of Peter's loyalty, and it seemed a little easy. He could have answered nothing, mumbled something, or said, I know him. Um, and she says, you are not also one of this man's disciples. The also here is going to mean that John was already known to her as a disciple of Jesus. You also, right? And so the servant girl presumably knew the other disciple to be a follower of Jesus. And when she saw him bringing in Peter, she said, in effect, oh, no, not another. Um, this man's in the Greek is contemptuous, more akin to this fellow's or this person's, right? This person's students. And he says, I am not. Peter responded to her negative statement with a negative of his own. Instead of being loyal to Jesus, he denied being a disciple. This seems to have happened at the door. It might have been a quick exchange that Peter didn't really give much thought to. Yet even that was a clear denial of association with Jesus. Right? Even those little passing phrases. And so the sense here that we get is that Peter was there not only because it was cold and he wanted warmth. Peter also wanted to blend in with a small crowd so that he could not stand out and want to be noticed. It was dangerous to be noticed because he was a disciple of the man that was arrested and in serious trouble. Verse 19 through 21, Annas is going to interrogate Jesus. Verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And so, Annas here wanted to know about Jesus' disciples, perhaps because of fear or jealousy. Uh, then he wanted to know about his doctrine, what Jesus taught that might be of concern to their religious establishment. And he basically brought the prisoner before him and asked, 
tell us everything that you're guilty of and everybody who is with you. And so in Jesus' reply, he did not mention his disciples at all. He protected them in every way possible. And so Jesus told Annas that he did not have a secret doctrine or teaching that could be revealed under interrogation. His teaching was quite open in the synagogues and in the temple. Jesus could even say, in secret, I have said nothing. And so in saying all of this, Jesus wasn't being uncooperative, right? Why do you ask me? Ask those that have heard me. He's only asserting his legal right here. There was to be no formal charge against the accused until witnesses had been heard and found to be truthful. And so it was the high priest's duty to call forth witnesses first, beginning with those for the defense. These basic legal protections for the accused under Jewish law were not observed in the trial of Jesus. We'll see that every one of his trials was done illegally against him. Interesting. And so... <clears throat> The Talmud will state that criminal process can either commence, not terminate, but during the course of the day. If the person be acquitted, the sentence may be pronounced during that day, but if he be condemned, the sentence cannot be pronounced till the next day. But no kind of judgment is to be executed either on the eve of the Sabbath or the eve of any festival. Interesting. Verse 22 through 24, the end of Jesus' appearance before Annas. Verse 22, And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? And then Anna sent him bound to Siaphis, the high priest. And so, <clears throat> one of these officers, this anonymous official began the physical abuse of Jesus that was going to end in his crucifixion. In his deity, Jesus knew his name. But as one of those who did not know what they did against God's Messiah, Luke 23, verse 34, his name was graciously not recorded here. And so his name's not recorded, but his crime was. Without warning, he strongly slapped Jesus with the palm of his hand and accused him of disrespect to the high priest. This blow was the signal for all the indignities which followed after. Jesus asked both the unnamed official and Annas to justify this physical abuse. Jesus exposed the shameful truth that they did not follow their own standards and practice of justice with Jesus of Nazareth. Annas had nothing to answer to Jesus. He sent Jesus on a more official trial to the man who held the actual office of the high priest and sent Jesus bound as if he was a dangerous criminal. Verse 25 through 27. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. And so, watching Jesus from a distance at the house of Annas, Peter hoped to mix into this small crowd and remain unnoticed. Yet because Peter was with them, therefore they noticed him. Luke 22, verse 61 will indicate that Peter could see Jesus probably at a distance. Peter likely saw the hard slap unexpectedly put upon Jesus and understood that this whole incident was going to be more violent and messy than he originally thought. The shock of this sight increased the level of stress and panic for Peter as he stood and warmed himself by the fire. This unnamed one at the fire asked the same question the servant girl did at the door in chapter 18, verse 17 even placing it in the negative as she did. For a second time, Peter said, I am not, and, did, and he denied any association with Jesus. And for a second time, we see that there was another disciple present, John, no doubt. Peter knew John was present and known as a disciple of Jesus, but he did not want to be known. And so, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose Peter, uh, ear Peter cut off, this is the kind of thing that John, only John would know, having a connection with the high priest in his household in John 18 and being a witness to the ear being cut off. Um, the relative of Malchus would pay special notice of the man who attacked his own kin. Even in the light of the night fire in the courtyard, he thought he recognized Peter as the man who attacked Malchus with a sword from behind. He said, did I not see you? The eye here is emphatic in the original as we say, did I not see thee with my own eyes? In Matthew 26, verse 74 is going to tell us that Peter denied this third time with cursing and swearing. 
hoping that this cursing and swearing was going to make them think even more that he was not associated with Jesus. We could say that at this point that it was not the faith of Peter that failed, it was his courage. And then immediately the rooster crowed. This fulfilled what Jesus said back in chapter 13 and must have immediately reminded Peter of the prediction that Jesus made in the upper room. Verse 28, Then they led Jesus from Siaphis to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So after the interrogation, Annas sent Jesus over to Siaphis for a trial in two parts. The first was hastily gathered assembly of the council recorded in Matthew 26. The second was the official daylight meeting of the Sanhedrin in Luke 22. The Gospel of John mentions only that Jesus was sent to Siaphis, and then Siaphis was sent to Jesus, and then on to Pilate. John focused more on the appearance of Jesus before the Roman leader, Pontius Pilate, and they went to the Praetorium. This word described the headquarters of Pilate in Jerusalem, likely at the Roman fortress Antonia, where Pilate held court and he conducted his public business. The term for Praetorium is going to denote the headquarters of the Roman military governor, as the governor of Judea was. In a Roman camp, the Praetorium was the commander's headquarters in the center of the camp. And so John used an ironic touch to expose the hypocrisy of the Jewish rulers here. They refused to break relatively small commands regarding a ceremonial defilement, but broke much greater commands in rejecting God's Messiah and condemning an innocent man to death here. And so they, 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 they didn't go into it so they could eat the Passover. This statement is going to introduce a controversy, namely this. Was the Last Supper a Passover meal? And was Jesus crucified on the Passover or the day following? This statement in John chapter 18 verse 28 will seem to indicate that Passover was on the coming day. The day Jesus would be crucified and that the Last Supper was the day before Passover. Yet several passages will seem to indicate that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. The best solution here to this difficult chronological problem seems to be that Jesus was crucified on the Passover, which would fit the whole reason of doing everything on the day, and the meal that they had the night before was the Passover meal held after sunset, which is the start of the day in Jewish reckoning. So we can speculate that Passover lambs were sacrificed on both days as necessity due to the massive number of lambs sacrificed in Jerusalem at the temple in Passover. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, later described it as being more than 200,000. That's a lot of work. And so there's another possibility as well by another commentator, and he says, It may be, however, that the Passover in this verse is the whole Passover festival, which lasted for seven days, is meant here, and that the expression, eat the Passover, refers not to the main Passover meal, which might have already taken place, but to the remaining meals that would be taken in the Passover season. Either, view could, be, uh, either could be in view, or both. Verse 29 through 32, the religious leaders are going to explain the matter to Pilate. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he was not an evildoer, we would have not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by which death that he would die. The religious leaders had reason to expect a favorable result as they brought Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Secular history presents Pilate as a cruel, ruthless man, completely insensitive to the moral feelings of others. Pilate had married a granddaughter of Caesar Augustus, and if it was not for his influential connections through marriage, he would have never even come to the relatively insignificant post that he held as the procurator of Judea. Philo, the ancient Jewish scholar from Alexandria, described Pilate as his corruption, his acts of insolence, his rapine, his habit of insulting people, his cruelty, his continual murders of the people untried and uncondemned, and his never-ending uh, gracious and most grievous in humanity, right? Not a good character. So consistent with Roman character, Pilate spoke directly to the matter at hand. 
He demanded to know what the accusation was. John recorded their evasion of the question. If he was not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. Right? They're kind of dodging the question here instead of just answering it. Pilate's going to respond to their evasion by telling them to resolve the matters themselves. If they would not bring Pilate an accusation that mattered to him, then they would have to judge him according to their own law and not bother the Romans. John does not record it here, but eventually the religious leaders did give a more specific answer to Pilate's demand for an accusation. Luke 23 verse 2 says, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Yet, without yet answering Pilate's demand for a specific accusation, the religious leaders explained why they did not want to judge him according to their own law. They wanted Jesus dead. And the Romans did, did not allow them to execute the guilty under their own law. Which is interesting. This is a throwback to Genesis 49, verse 9, where it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, which is the right to capital punishment, nor a lawgiver between its feet, until Shiloh comes. Well, this is recorded in the Talmud that in 46 AD, the religious establishment went out and rent their clothing and put on sackcloth and ashes because the Roman procurator at the time removed capital punishment from Israel and it fell under Roman occupation. And they thought the word of God had been broken. They're like, where's the Messiah? But they didn't realize that there was a little boy working in a carpenter shop. He had come, just not on a great white horse like they had anticipated. He came as a suffering servant first. And so there were times when the religious leaders asked uh, or risked the disapproval of the Roman authorities and executed those that they considered guilty without permission. And Acts 7, verse 54 through 60 is going to record one of those executions of Stephen by stoning. When the Jewish leaders did put someone to death in this unauthorized way, it was generally done by stoning. <clears throat> All right. Verse 33 through 35. Pilate's going to question. Jesus is going to give some clarity to the matter. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And so Pilate entered the praetorium again. John is going to combine two appearances of Jesus before Pilate, separated by an appearance of Jesus before Herod Antipas that's recorded in Luke 23. Pilate hoped to give this problem to Herod because he ruled over Galilee, where Jesus was from. Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate, and this is likely the start of that second appearance. And Pilate was already involved in this case, having sent a detachment of many Roman troops to arrest Jesus in John 18. So this was his first look at the man these religious leaders claimed was very dangerous. Yet Pilate's question here revealed his own doubt. Pilate had already seen wild revolutionaries who claimed to be kings. Speaking of the anarchy in Judea, which followed Herod's death in 4 BC, Josephus will say anyone might make himself king by putting himself at the head of a band of rebels whom he fell in with. He asked this question because Jesus didn't look like a revolutionary or a criminal. These were the only types who would be foolish enough to claim to be the king of the Jews in the face of Roman domination. Pilate had seen these kinds of men before, and he knew right off the bat that Jesus was not like them. And so Jesus says, are you speaking for yourself? Jesus wants to know if Pilate really wanted to know, or if he's asking this question on behalf of those who had already condemned Jesus. The answer could be different depending on where the question was coming from. If Pilate asked it of himself, the question would have meant, art thou a political king conspiring against Caesar? If he asked it because of Siaphas' prompting, it would have meant, Art thou the messianic king of Israel? The answer to the first question would have been no. The answer to the second question would have been yes. And so, what have you done? Pilate said that he, as a Roman, had no interest in Jewish spiritual or social ideas. Pilate simply understood that if the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead, he must have done something wrong, and he wanted to find out what that was. Jesus could have given a wonderful answer to the question, what have you done? He was without sin. He never did anything wrong against either God or man. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He calmed the storm. He walked on water. He fed the multitude. He defeated demons, and he raised the dead. 
He taught the truth so clearly and powerfully that it astonished his own listeners. He fearlessly confronted corruption. He poured his life into a few men who were destined in God's plan to turn the world totally upside down or right side up. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world or were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And so Jesus plainly told Pilate that he was a king and could say, My kingdom. He also plainly told Pilate that his kingdom was not a rival political kingdom. It was not of this world. In contrast to the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of Jesus originates in heaven. In contrast to the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of Jesus has peace for its foundation. Right? He says, if it was of this world, my servants would be fighting. And so we might imagine that Pilate was relieved and very satisfied to hear that the kingdom of Jesus was not from here. Pilate may have concluded that Rome, therefore, had nothing to fear from either Jesus and his kingdom. Uh, the Romans thought they knew something about kingdoms and their might, that armies, navies, swords, and battles was what measured the strength of kingdoms. What Jesus knew was that his own kingdom, though not of this world, was much mightier than Rome and would continue to expand in influence when Rome had already passed away. He says, my kingdom is not from here. Augustine observed from this verse that earthly kingdoms are based upon force, pride, the love of human praise, the desire for domination and self-interest, all displayed by Pilate in the Roman Empire. The heavenly kingdom exemplified by Jesus in the cross is based on love, sacrifice, humility, and righteousness, and is to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness in 1 Corinthians 1.23. Verse 37 and 38. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you, right, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. He says, are you a king then? This is a statement that interested Pilate. He didn't mind the religious leaders among the Jews, even the crazy ones, as long as they kept the peace and didn't challenge the rule of Rome. A rival king, on the other hand, might challenge, and Pilate was wanting to investigate this. Jesus did not deny that he's a king. He insisted that he was born a king and to be a different kind of a king. He came to be the king of truth and that he should bear witness to the truth. He says, for this cause I was born and for this cause I came into the world. Because decades after this, Paul urged young Timothy with these words. In 1 Timothy 6.13, he says, Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. The good confession of Jesus was that, was that he was the king. His kingdom came from heaven, and that it was a kingdom of eternal truth in contrast to earthly power. And Pilate says, what is truth? Pilate's cynical question showed that he thought Jesus claimed to be a king of truth was foolish. Probably, Pilate did not mean that there was no truth, but that there was no truth in the kind of spiritual kingdom that Jesus represented. For Pilate, from his point of view, soldiers and armies were truth. Rome was truth. Caesar was truth. And political power and might was truth. And so, many in our day are going to ask Pilate's question, but from a different perspective. You know, what is truth? They'll note that many things are true only on the basis of personal preference or perspective. They think all truth is personal or individual. We live in a day now where we have moral relativism. You have your truth and I have my truth, which is nonsense. There's God's truth and there's falsehood. They think that there is no, that there is no true truth about God, that there's only my truth and your truth, and one is just as good as the other. Though this kind of thinking is quite strong in our day, it denies the one who said, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into this world, that I should bear witness to the truth, the truth, the absolute truth. Pilate spoke to the religious leaders who wanted Jesus dead and clearly told them that Jesus was not guilty. Pilate went far beyond saying that Jesus was not guilty of a crime worthy of death. He found no fault in him at all. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. Verse 39 through 40. 
But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release you to the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And so, judging that there was something different, the innocent, about Jesus, Pilate hoped that this custom of releasing a prisoner, uh, especially at Passover, might deliver this man whom Pilate knew that was innocent. And so Pilate phrased the question this way, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Uh, as, as a way to appeal to the Jewish crowd. He thought that they would want a man named as their own king to be spared death by crucifixion. But the crowd rejected Jesus and chose Barabbas instead. Pilate hoped that they were going to spare Jesus, but the crowd instead condemned him. Matthew 27 verse 20 will say that this was not a spontaneous response from a crowd, but one that was deliberately promoted by the religious leaders. Interesting. Do we see the same things happening today? Mark 15 verse 11 will say, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And we still see a lot of religious leaders doing everything they can to destroy the truth today, to accept in falsehood. When the crowd chose Barabbas instead of Jesus, it's going to reflect the fallen nature of all of humanity. The name Barabbas sounds very much like son of the father. They chose a false, violent son of the father instead of a true son of the father. This prefigures the future embrace of the ultimate Barabbas, the one that's popularly known and called the Antichrist. People today will still reject Jesus and choose another. Their Barabbas might be lust, it could be intoxication, it might be their self and the comforts of life. Mark 15 verse 7 will tell us one of his, uh, he was one of these several insurrectionists uh, who committed murder in the insurrection. He was a rebel. And so the Romans would have thought Barabbas as a terrorist, and many Jews would think of him as a freedom fighter. And so he was kind of a member of this local resistance movement. And because of his opposition to the Romans, he was going to be a hero to many of the Jews. And he uses the term almost certainly to denote, as Josephus habitually does, a zealot insurgent. In Mark 15, verse 27, the same word is used of the two men who were crucified along with Jesus. Barabbas was accused of at least three crimes, theft in John 18, insurrection in Mark 15, and murder in Mark 15. If anybody knew what it meant that Jesus died in his place, it would have been Barabbas. He was a terrorist and a murderer, yet he was set free while Jesus was crucified. The cross Jesus hung upon was probably originally intended for Barabbas. You can find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.